Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for holding back the rain that we could gather together here mm-hmm. again today. And Lord, we just pray now that you'd use Pastor Izzy to speak t- to us, to encourage us, to show us your word and how it applies to our life. We pray now, just as that wind is blowing across the sand, Lord, we just pray for a blowing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that would encourage us, that would fill us to overflowing with your love and your mercy. And we ask that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, before we jump into the Palm Sunday message I have prepared for, you can start by getting ready by turning to, to John's Gospel, chapter 12. That's where we're going to look at the St. John 12 this morning. But before we do, I, Brother Barnabas, would you come up here for a second? He, this guy is one of our, our prayer team guys when you're done with service, if you need prayer. He's over there with Herb uh, back there at the table. And these men are really devout men of prayer, and they get a lot of answers. And I know some folks really need that, that bolstering for their faith. So if you need prayer afterwards, they'll, he'll be here to pray with you. And, um, and uh, he's going to share testimony. He's been passing out uh, tracts and sharing the gospel on Ali'i Drive. Some of you might have seen him in front of the oldest church we have in the Hawaiian, this side of the island there, the Makuakawa Congregational Church on Ali'i Drive. And uh, would you share a testimony what the Lord's been doing with you? And uh, it's pretty cool what, what the Lord has uh, I, used him. I'm really privileged to be here today. I give the Lord all the praise and all the glory for anything I can do to help, uh, you know, with, uh, share the gospel with folks. And um, tomorrow's April 10th. It'll be uh, Passover, the beginning of Passover. But it's also my 45th birthday. Now, you may not think I look 45. But on 45. April 10th, 1972, I was saved. Your spiritual birthday. Yeah, okay. my spiritual birthday, 45 <laughs> years ago yeah, uh, tomorrow. So um, I give God praise for that. And uh, I was honorably discharged from the U.S. Navy during Vietnam and uh, found myself in California and thought, well, uh, I'm going to see what California is all about. And as most places in the world, there's some good things and some not so good things. And I met into three fellows that were uh, Satan worshipers, and they were on their way to a black mass, they called it, in uh, Big Sur, California. And they said, we're going to ride a freight train, and we'll get off at uh, Watsonville, California. And uh, they have a place there where you can get free food and some clothes and things like that. We're going to go in there first, you know. So I didn't have no place to go, so I got on this freight train with these three guys and and uh, got off there in Watsonville. And across from the freight yard was a rescue mission, the Pajaro Rescue Mission. And uh, we went in there at 10.30 in the morning, and the superintendent gave a gospel message. And when the invitation was given, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, and I came forward and got on my knees with the, with the superintendent, uh, Rufus Baker. He's in, he's in heaven now, and uh, accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. It changed my whole life. I became the, uh, super, uh, you know, the superintendent's assistant, I guess you could say. I was the, what they called the house man. I was the youngest guy on the staff, held the keys, you know, And uh, I did that for nine months, and the Lord blessed me enough to go to Bible college about 10 years later. And I got to go back to that mission and run it for a while, you know, as the superintendent. Wow. But um, ever since I got saved, I, you know, when I first got uh, saved or so, I I didn't really know how to preach. So I would just get, like, they used to call him Mr. Microphone, and you would hook the wire around a radio, (laughs) and I'd stand on the corner, and I'd just read Bible verses that I had typed out to people that walked by, you know. Well, I learned about these Bible tracts, and Jack Chick, bless his heart, passed away at 92 years ago in October. Mm -hmm. So he's with the Lord now, but he started these, and he got the idea from the communist Chinese because they came to the United States and saw how the young kids would go to the drugstore and read comic books. And so they thought, well, let's make comic book form of communism and drop them from airplanes to the Chinese so that the common man can understand what communism is about. Well, hmm. Jack decided, well, why don't I do that with the gospel? <laughs> I'll make, he was a cartoonist. He could have had a secular job, but he decided to make these comic books about the gospel. So ever since then, I've been passing these out. I'll be uh, in front of the old church across from the King's Palace uh, today about 2 o'clock. I usually give out about, well, as many as I, you know, 
usually between 20 and 40 I can give out. And I'll do that a couple of times a day, uh, a week, and then on uh, a couple of times a week I'll sit in front of the church with my guitar and sing gospel songs and I have a little display with free Bible tracts and give away Bibles and such, but you don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people have come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior with something like this. So what I'm saying is that one day I was sitting there and a man came by and he says, you know what, I love what you're doing and I'll buy all the tracks you need. So he just sent me a huge box of tracks. He paid for them. He lives in Washington State. Wow. And uh, he said, if you need more, just let me know and I'll send you more. So he sent me a big old box of them. So if anybody wants to help in this ministry, it's really easy. You can be a secret agent for Jesus. <laughs> you can leave them someplace. You can give them to somebody you know. You can just hand them to people. And what works for me is I just ask them as they walk by, can I give you something to read today? And I just hand them one, and if they say no thanks, it's no thanks. And if they take them, they take them. And you would not believe how many people are thirsty for the Word of God now. They're afraid of the things that are going on in the world, and this is like a glass of cold water to them. And it's mm -hmm. got the plan of salvation on it. And on the back, there's a phone number you can call, and there's a real person to talk to. And there's a website, and you can order a, 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 an assortment, you know, from them or whatever. They're in California. But God blesses this ministry, and anything you can do to help plant those seeds will maybe lead somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't yes. know who will come up and shake your hand in heaven someday and say, thank you for leaving that you know, in the phone booth or at the restaurant or giving that to me on the street that day because I came to know Christ as my Savior. And if you want to use these, when I was a young Christian, we used to leave them for our waitress yep. after we were done. But don't be the cheesy, cheap Christian that puts no tip and says, well, I gave her that, you know. <laughs> you, you put a big tip in that, and then she'll want to read it. But yeah. <laughs> Don't give us a bad name, you you That's stingy true. little tippers. You so know. anyway, <laughs> long story short, I want to finish up because I know the pastor has a beautiful message for us this morning. The Lord wants to speak to our heart. But we have no gospel rescue mission here on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have plenty of them on the mainland. But we have no emergency shelter here. We have the Hope Center. But there's usually about a three-month waiting list to get into the Hope Center. There's plenty of homeless people. You don't see all of them because a lot of them are around. They have no place to stay. There's no emergency shelter for them. So I pray each and every day that God will open up a gospel rescue mission here because, number one, they get the bread of life. You know, they mm -hmm. get the water of, from God, you know, that, that spiritual water. Living water. And then they get the food and they get the clothes and the things like that and a place to stay, shower and shave and stuff like that. So remember the lost and the homeless in your prayers. If you don't know that God doesn't care about the, ho the lost and the homeless and the poor, just read Isaiah or the Psalms or the Proverbs or the Gospels and you'll see that God does love the poor. And mm -hmm. thank God for Pastor Izzy and the ministry he has to help serve breakfast for these folks when they need something to eat and all the folks that help him do that. And mm -hmm. uh, I just give him praise and, and all the glory for God because God of his glory. ministry. Give God all the glory for yeah. everything that Pastor Izzy does. Thank you so much. And if you I'll want be at some the of these tracks, table. yeah, he'll be back there. And, and you're welcome to get some. If you want to share in this ministry, I can give you some or, um, you know, yeah. we can talk. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Give man. that to Kai, okay. would you? Well, guys, we're going to look at John's Gospel now, chapter 12. And this is... um. You know, teaching Poem Sunday, we have the privilege. It, it's found in three of the Gospels, the, the account by three. Uh, Matthew tells us the account of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. Um, Luke also tells us that this of this same day. And John also does. And each one of them, I'm, I'm one of those fellows, I love to read all the accounts and kind of picture myself there hearing the stories from the different fellows telling me what they saw because they each had different things that they point out. They each, you know, on that, just like we would have if we had three different folks sitting around watching something go on, even we, they, would, they would, might give different accounts. They might point out different things that stood out to them on that day. And so John's gospel has a little, a little insight today that I want to point out to you that if you're not familiar, some, how many of you have heard of Palm Sunday message with Jesus riding the donkey. Matthew says, the donkey on which no one had ever sat. Now, I, I, you know, last year I went in detail over that growing up on a farm. How many of you have ever had to break a horse or a, or a wild donkey? I mean, to, to, to go and to put a blanket, like they said, they put a blanket over this donkey's back and they, and, and then Jesus just got on it. And it's a, it's a baby donkey that no one has ever been 
on. This is okay. This I pointed out last year, but this is a really shows the magnificence of Jesus, the the command over creation that he had that that donkey, because I don't know about you, but I've seen baby donkeys. As soon as you touch them, they start doing this thing like this, and they they kick wildly. And you got to stay away from the back end, because they kick with a really you know sharp, brutal kick. And Jesus just mounted that donkey and rode into Jerusalem. And I pointed out from Matthew's gospel, the people cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. It says they were crying out, which they're yelling. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna is Hebrew for save now. Save now. Now, it's a, it's a Hebrew word that's a mark of respect. It's um, You can only cry it out to somebody who has the, the power, to, the position to be able to save. You don't say, it's not like, oh, save me, help anybody, I'm drowning. That, that's like save, you know, save now, but like anybody will do. This is um, what, a word specific for save now. You, you're the political, you're, you're the king. You're, you're like the, the one in power. Come and save us as the king. And Jesus, as the disciples were, were, were crying out Hosanna, the Pharisees were saying, hey, you tell them to be quiet. Because they, they understood that he would, they were, they were, the crowds were saying, Jesus is a great guy. He's a king. And they're saying, don't do that. Don't, you know, and, and the Pharisees were jealous because he was getting the, the, the mark of respect, we'd say, as they were doing this. And their jealousy, John is going to point out in John 12, grew. It grew and grew and grew. They, they were so jealous. You know, they were supposed to be the religious leaders, but they, Jesus looked at them and said, you whitewashed sepulchers. Whitewashed tomb is what it is. You're, 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 you're pretty on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. They had lost the life of the spirit that, that God wanted to impart to man, and they, they really squ squelched it. They really put a kibosh on people's desire to serve God. And here comes Christ Riding in fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, 9, riding humbly on the donkey that was prophesied that the Messiah would do. And don't think the Pharisees didn't know this. They told, the, they told them, you tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they remain silent, the very rocks will cry out. Because this has to be fulfilled. You know, Jesus knew the scripture. This is all to be fulfilled. This, this very special day. But John tells us, the, the, some of the personal stuff of this day. Now, I want you to enter the story with me on the inside. You're in the inner group with Jesus, you know, his disciples that were around him getting ready for the lead-in to this day. Because that's where John picks up in chapter 12, verse 1. He starts with what happened right before this day to get the, the, some preparation some folks don't know about. Some of you know this story, too. You, you'll, you'll hear it and you'll go, oh, yeah, I learned this one a long time ago. But this is the story where Jesus was in the house and Mary is going to anoint him with a very costly oil for his, for his death. And this, John was present for this, and John gives us some interesting insights on this going on of this day. Let me read it to you here. John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. That's where Lazarus was and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper. And, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. So Lazarus is enjoying, you know, sitting at the table with Jesus. And I, I have to take it that John was at the table too, because he's giving these details. But it says, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard. This is this is, um, well, she, she took it and she wiped and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house, it says, was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, that little rat, he, uh, it doesn't say that, I said that. He, he said, who, it's the, the fellow who was intending to betray Jesus, John says. He said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? And the and the proceeds given to the poor people. Now, John tells us why he said it. You guys know this, right? He, he, did he really care about the money going to the poor? 
No, verse 6 says, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the, the money box. He was the guy that carried the money box for the, the treasurer of the group. And it says, and he used to pilfer what was put into it. So this guy was a crook, right in the inner circle. And then Jesus said, verse 7, Therefore, he said, let her alone, that she might keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have what? Me. You know, they, they didn't have the perspective quite right. They, how many of you would have liked to go back in time if we had a time machine and see Jesus on this earth? I mean, anyone volunteer to go with me? I'd be like, we probably could get a line so long we'd be jamming up the booth to get in, you know? Because, I mean, who wouldn't want to sit there and be, see Jesus, you know, in person? And, and he's telling them, you, 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 you don't always have me with you. She, she chose the good part. She, she got me ready for my burial. Now, verse 9 tells us there was a large crowd of Jews that had learned that Jesus was there. And they also came, but not for Jesus' sake only. Now, I've pointed this out before, but how many of you know the reason why they came? Not, not for Jesus, just to see. I mean, we would go just to see Jesus. But there was another reason that they came, this large crowd. And it tells us, John tells us why. They came that they might also see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Remember, just a few days prior to this, if you read the gospel accounts, Jesus went to the, to the tomb and, and Mary and Martha both were crying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have had to die. And Jesus said, it's for your sake that I wasn't here. It was to your advantage that I wasn't here. It's so you could gain an understanding that they did. See, they thought Jesus could just heal the sick up to this point. What they didn't understand is Jesus could raise the dead. So Jesus said, it's for your benefit that we weren't here, guys. Then he goes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone. And they said, oh, it's, gonna, it's four days. He's going to stink. Like you have to tell Jesus, you know, about body decomposition or something. He doesn't know anything. So, you know, you're a good rabbi, but you don't understand rotting corpses, Lord. So he's going to smell. And Jesus said, roll the stone away. And then he called out, Lazarus. And what happened? Lazarus, come forth. Now, this is a graveyard. I, I, I point this out. That What if he would have said, come forth? All the graves would have popped open and dead people would have popped out. So he was very specific. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes hopping out and he's still bound in the, in the burial cloth. You know, he's like a little mummy. Just pink, 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 pink. I could just see him coming out. I'm coming, Lord. You know? And Jesus is like, unbind him. Give him something to eat. Give him something to drink. He's been dead for four days. He's probably thirsty. So, eh, the Lord knows. And, but see, after they, Christ raised him from the dead, news started get going around. That he doesn't just heal the sick. He has power to raise the dead. That guy that had been dead four days, he just said, come here. Come forth. And life was put back in his body. And he came bounding out. The word had spread. People, people, and by the way, I can't fault them because I'm pretty sure I would have been one of the first people to go f find this dude, Lazarus. W would any of you do this with me? Go find this guy after he's raised and say, could you tell me, how was it? Okay, I mean, on the other side, you know, like, would anyone else here be curious to ask someone who'd been dead for four days what, what was on the other side of death besides me? Any, any, anyone else's curiosity be going, well, I'll go find that dude. Come on, let's, see, let's interview him, man. I got some questions. Was there a light? Was it a tunnel? Did you see angels? What, I mean, you know how the movies portray it. I'd be one of the first guys going, I want to find this dude. Because he was dead, and Jesus called him back to life. I want to know, probably like anyone else, natural curiosity, what's on the other side? Well, the crowds, John tells us, were there not just for Jesus' sake, but they also wanted to see Lazarus. And I think they've got the same curiosity. Human nature hasn't changed, has it? 
They got the same curiosity. They want to know, Lazarus, what's on the other side? Now, John 12, 12. This is where we pick up the Poem Sunday message. If you're, you know, I like to use these little memory techniques. John 12, 12 is the day where we begin the story of the palms being thrown down. On the next day, a large crowd had come to the feast. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches and they went out to meet him and they began to cry out, to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, he sat on it as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. The foal, a little, uh, the babe of it, it would be a baby donkey, we would say. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now, verse 16 is my most favorite. I know people read right over this, but I love this verse. You can highlight this one. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that he had done these th or that they had done these things to him. They didn't understand the whole poems being thrown down in the road. They didn't understand the donkey ride. They didn't get, what's this all about? I mean, Matthew is busy telling us the story how Jesus said, hey, two of you, go over to the village opposite us and you're going to find a donkey on which no one has ever sat and untie it and bring it to me. I need it. And when they say to you, what are you doing untying that donkey? I, because in their culture, if you take a donkey, this is like stealing a car. Well, more like stealing a four-wheeler. You know, this is, this is like four-wheel drive because donkeys are all-terrain vehicles. So, so it, it, we use them in the Grand Canyon in Arizona to go down the Havasupai Falls and stuff. So that, but if you take someone's donkey in the Middle East, you can get your hand cut off for, for thievery. I mean, I mean really lopped off. No mercy. That is not even allowed. And two of Jesus' disciples, this is where I always like to put myself in the story. What if you were one of the two? You two. Carl, Barnabas, you're going to go get the donkey. They're on their way. You know what the Bible says they were talking about? They were talking about, you untie it. No, you untie it. No, you untie it. And Jesus said, if they ask you, what are you doing? Then he said, just tell them the Lord has need of it and they'll let it go. They'll send it with you. So I can just see him going, look, you untie it. I'll tell them the Lord has need of it. Right? I mean, if I was one of the two, I'd volunteer for the I'll tell them the Lord has need of it line. You untie. But the whole way there, they had to be thinking, this is a little kooky. We're going to another town. We're not even... From this town, we don't know the people. We're going to go up and find a donkey no one has ever sat on, untie it, and take it. And Jesus says, it's all going to be okay. Now, by the way, don't do this unless Jesus tells you to, because you get a lot of trouble. But you guys know what happened, right? In Matthew's Gospel, they get there, they untie the donkey, and just as Jesus said, they said, the Lord has need of it, and they said, okay, take it. And they brought the donkey to Jesus. And here, they give him the ride. They, the people are shouting. They're throwing down the branches. Matthew and Luke both tell us they put their garments also. They took their robes and they laid them like you would for a king to prepare the road. You know, Remember, this is dirt roads. Here comes the king of kings, the lord of lords. They, they're, they're taking their garments and they're laying them like... like um, Red carpet treatment. Yeah, that's it. Red carpet. Putting the palm leaves down and making it like for the king to come in. Hosanna, Hosanna, saved up. But John tells me in verse 16 something precious. Did the disciples understand these things when it was going on? What does it say? These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him. And then they remembered that they had done these things to him. When the day was actually happening, this day we celebrate every year, we remember 
Poem Sunday, and we think, oh man, if I would have been there, well, you know, what would we be doing? Getting the most branches or getting as close as we can to Jesus as he passed by on the donkey? How many would like to get really close, like you're putting your garment and you just like accidentally brush against him as he goes by? Would anyone here touch him besides me? Like just, just a little sneak of touch, you know? He's, I mean, he's riding by like, it's the king. Of, I mean, we're talking to the Lord. I'd be like, here you go, Lord. You, do you remember the woman who said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment? She had an issue of blood. Suffered for years and years, decades, with this, with this constant bleeding. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. She snuck up behind him in a, in a crowd. And she touched, you guys know this story, right? She touches his garment. What happened to her issue of blood? Cured. Cured right then. And Jesus, perceiving that power had gone out from him, said, stop, who touched me? And then Peter and John are, you know, like the bodyguards. Lord, we're trying to keep them back, but everybody wants a piece of you. You know, they all want to touch you. And, and, and what do you mean, who touched you? And he goes, no, power has gone out from me. And it says she came forward really you know, scared because she knows it was her. And so she tells what happened and how she knew if she, and what was, Je what did, Je I love Jesus. Daughter, your faith has made you what? Well, you're whole. Go in peace. Don't worry. But, but did this, oh, does anyone else, okay, in that story, did Peter and John perceived the power that went out from Jesus to touch the woman's life? No. no. How far away were they from this spiritual circumstance? I mean, were they way far away? They're standing right there. I want to point this out because sometimes God is at work in one person and they're sitting right next to you. And you think God ain't doing nothing. I don't see anything. I don't get it. And God could be doing a miracle for the person right next to you in the very moment like this lovely couple holding hands you could be holding hands and god's touching the wife and he's going i don't feel nothing what's happening does that stop the lord in our lives not at all he meets each individual right where they're at he knows and sometimes we need to leave a little room for us. This is why I say verse 16 is so dear to me. Because the disciples, and if ever this has happened to you, that some spiritual thing happened and you did not understand it at first, guess what? Right here in the good book, you're in good company. The disciples who are right there, watching the whole procession, probably throwing down their own robes and getting branches, They didn't understand at first. In fact, they didn't understand. And I, I, this is why it's so important to me. John gives me a perspective that none of the other gospel write, writers write. He says, they did not understand it until Jesus was glorified. Then, when he was glorified. Now, glorified means he was changed from this earthly body to his heavenly body. Did John ever see Jesus in that heavenly body? Yes. In that resurrected form? In fact, Jesus appears to him after he's come from the, from the grave. He's, hey guys, it's me. Oh, it's a ghost. No, you got something to eat? He eats in front of him. He says, here, stick your finger right there and hold the hands. Stick your hand in my... But Thomas, remember Thomas wasn't with him? Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it. Just because they said, you can tell these guys trusted each other too. Like, like I ain't believing it just because they said, I want to stick my finger in the hole in his hands. I want to stick my hand in the hole in his side. Eight days later, the Lord appears again. This time Thomas is with him. First thing Jesus does, Thomas, go ahead, stick your finger in here. Stick your hand in here. It's me. Be thou no longer unbelieving, but be believing. He had to... Now, I don't... I never knock... I know people call him Doubting Thomas, but I think I'm wired like him. If, if they said, Christ is risen, I'd be like, I want to see it for myself. I want 
I'm a tactile learner. I want to touch him myself. I want to know for certain he's really resurrected. And I'm glad he's in the Bible. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that guy was there. Because, I, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, I heard it, I believe. I'm like, good for you. But I, I, I like faith with a little substance, you know. I like, I'm just a, maybe some people say I'm a little bit more of a doubter, you know, on some of the, th- but, but I don't think God has trouble showing himself to even the doubter. And I don't think God has trouble with the idea that we don't get it all at first. Because John, who's humble enough to say, and the disciples, he didn't just say me. <laughs> who's he talking about? The whole group. We didn't get this at first. Until he was glorified. And then, when we see, see something happens to our understanding when we recognize Christ When he was glorified, he was resurrected, right? Risen from the dead. When our understanding is opened up to where we recognize Christ resurrected, risen from the dead, overcoming death, all of a sudden, the things that were written about him in the Old Testament, those scriptures that seem kind of cryptic, you know, he's going to ride in on a donkey, he's going to come humbly, he's going to be... cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, all those scriptures we did, you know, what is that all about? Those things, I believe, for the person who doesn't recognize Christ resurrected, that those things written of him are hard to understand. Until you come to an understanding who Christ is, that he really is the resurrected, glorified one of God. All the stuff that's written of him, the prophecies and everything, you're going to probably struggle with. As soon as you come to put your faith in that resurrected one that that did that work, what happens to your understanding of spiritual things? What what, what does God gift us from his throne? The gift of his Holy Spirit who begins to lead us and guide us and teach us all things. Bring to our remembrance things that Christ has spoken. I believe they didn't get their understanding until after he was glorified because what happened after he was glorified? Jesus said, you guys, wait here till you receive something from heaven. Stay right here. Remember they had to wait in the upper room? What did they get, that wonderful gift? The Holy Spirit. Wait here till you get the Holy Ghost. Once you have the Holy Ghost, boom. Now the understanding begins to come. Because, guys, we're talking about God's Spirit. The one who inspired. Peter said all Scripture is it is inspired by God. It is is profitable, profitable for teaching and reproof and exhortation and, and to give instruction. But see, it's a spirit breathe thing, and without the spirit to help us perceive it, we could be like the like Peter and John standing next to the woman who's getting healed. Well, I don't get it. I don't see no power going out. And Jesus going, power went out from me. Stop the procession. Somebody touch me. Jesus knew it, but they didn't. We got to understand, sometimes we don't get things at first. Now, what about if you've been in Christ a long time and you've already learned these things? What about the ones who are just starting? And they got all those questions. And they're just like, oh man, I don't know this. I don't get this. Or what about this? And, you know, if you've gone down this journey already, you're just smiling inside because you're like, I remember those days. But do we have a God that is patient to help us to grow and to learn of him and to see the things that he wants to reveal to us? Because he wants to show us things concerning his son. The things concerning his son are so great. Well, this chapter, I'm not sure I can, I might have to just speed read you the rest of it just so you can hear it. I mean, the rest of this chapter, John, there's just just a couple little points I want to point, maybe I'll just buzz through okay i've reserved the right to do this i got a few more palm sundays in me if the lord doesn't come back i can i can highlight in detail some of the other portions but but then i would like to show you something in their understanding is they they don't get it verse 17 says so the people that were with him with christ when he called lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead they continued to testify about Christ. They're, they're telling everybody, this guy raised the dead. 
For this reason, John says also that the people went out to meet him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone out after him. They were getting jealous. Now, now it says there were some of the Greeks among them that were going up to worship at the feast and they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida and they, of Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, is Philip a Hebrew name or a Greek name? Does anyone know the cultures? Being raised at the time, we had to learn these things. You know, like my father would be like, what's your name? What's it mean? Where is it from? You know, he made me learn all these things when I was growing up. And, you know, my wife, Janet, God's gracious gift. That's a pretty good name. I like the Jans. I got two right here in the front row. God's gracious gift. Doubled up right there. He says, he says, so Philip, by the way, is a Greek name. It's not a Hebrew name. So who's coming to seek an audience with Jesus? Do you notice that? The Greeks. The Gentiles we call them. Non-Jewish people. And they go, well, we want to see Jesus. But if you wanted an in with the main guy, what would you do? They go, oh, there's a Greek dude. Let's go talk to him. We'll talk to him, ask him if he could get us an audience with the master. So they go to him and ask. And so Philip, it says, came, then told Andrew. Andrew came and told Philip, and they, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Andrew and Philip then came and told Jesus. So, so Philip didn't even go by himself. He had to get Andrew to go with him. Andrew, come on. These people want to see Jesus. Well, Jesus answered them. And he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, John, Matthew doesn't tell us this part, so I want you to catch what, John was there. He's, he's in the, he had to be present. I have a feeling he's still playing bodyguard. Right next to Jesus, when Andrew and Philip come up and say, hey, there's a bunch of Greeks that want to talk to you, Jesus. So he can tell us from firsthand, hearing what they said and what Jesus is going to say to those guys. And I say this is important for, how many of you here are not Jewish? We have a lot of Gentiles here. Then this would be words that he speaks to Gentiles, like for them. You know, I mean, he's, he's on a Jewish mission to fulfill the Jewish scriptures, right? And does he take time out to take care of the Gentiles on the way? Sure. Look at this. He says, guys, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now this is beautiful. This is what he's telling the Gentile guys. Guys, I'm going to go die now. But that's okay. If you want to gain your life, what do you have to do? You have to lose it. He, he, uses, he uses a agricultural reference. One, one that, this is an agricultural society. A grain of wheat, right? A little kernel of wheat. If you put it on the shelf and say, that's a really special kernel of wheat. I, I really like that kernel. I'm going to keep that kernel. Just, let's put it in a little piece of, a little glass jar and just, just hang on to it. If you do that, the little kernel is going to lay in the jar and just be by itself. And yes, it will remain a kernel of wheat. It will have its identity. But for it to become fruitful, what do you got to do with it? You take it out of the glass, put it in the ground, bury it, and then put some water over it. And you've seen the time lapse, right, on that, Geo? The little seed goes, splits open. Then the little shoot comes out, and the root goes down, and comes up, and wiggles up to the surface. And then all of a sudden, you know, I love time lapse because... For us impatient farmers, this is much quicker. All of a sudden, poof, you got the stalks of wheat, you know, and the heads on it. And each head of wheat's got multiple kernels in it. And Jesus said, from that one seed, it can produce hundreds of seeds. It can become greatly fruitful. But for it to be fruitful, it has to first die. And what was he about to go do? I mean, he, he's taking a moment out to tell the Gentiles what he's up to. He says, guys, I got to go do something. What's he going to go do? Die for us. But for, if he went to die for us, 
then he could have he could have stayed. I'm gonna stay the son of God. I ain't dying for nobody. Let's keep my own identity here. I'm not losing it. But if he had done that, he'd save himself, but not others. Instead, he lost his life to save us. So what's he tell him? He says, guys, truly, I say to you, unless this grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. And if anyone serves me, he's got to follow me. Where I am, there will my servant also be. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If you serve the Lord, God will honor your life. This is one of the best things you could tell to someone who's, maybe they're not raised with a lot of religion. That's okay. May, is, Jesus made it really simple. He says, anyone who wants to serve me, God will honor him. Does this pay to have God honor you? When, when, I mean, when the Lord, the Father in heaven honors our lives, can he pull off any kind of special perks for us? Can he, like, do those little s things that people go, well, that doesn't happen for me. And I'm like, are you serving the Lord? Because he made it real simple. He just said, if you serve me, you'll be where I am. I'll be with you. God will honor you. That's the whole message to the Gentiles. He didn't even give us anything extra. Like, just serve, just serve me. And, and don't worry about the rest. Lay down your life. You lose your life, you'll gain it. That's it. Gospel in a nutshell. Barnabas is going to use that today on the street when he's out. That's all there is for the Gentiles. Then Jesus foretells his death. And this, I think, I don't know if this was for the Gentiles that were there or for all of them. Because he says in verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled. And what I shall say, what, what shall I say? He says, Father, save them from this hour. Or, no, save me from this hour. He says, But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice. Now John tells us this. I like this. they got to put this in the movie. When they made this part, this is what they should put. They should read the gospel for the text of John because a voice came from heaven and said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so, so the crowd of people that stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. And others were saying, no, angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Did you guys know that on that Palm Sunday, a voice cracked from heaven th like a thundering peal of God saying this this right here this he says I, 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 he says he, Jesus Christ glorify Father your name and he says I have both glorified it and will glorify it again man they don't put that in the movie why why would you leave that out don't, Spielberg needs to do a remake Put that in, you know, like the sound of He could do a great job, you know, sound effects, crackling. And some people going, I think it was an angel. No, I think. And Jesus answers, this voice wasn't for my sake. Whose sake was it for? You know, how many of you ever had people say, well, if God's real, why did he just like speak up? You know, I mean, he's God, right? I mean, couldn't he just like make some really, make it clear? He did. But people read right over this. They don't even include it in the Palm Sunday story. I'm like, you can't leave that out. And Jesus says, now judgment is upon this world. And the ruler of this world will be cast out. And he says, and if I, if I am lifted up from this earth, then I will draw all men to myself. And then he was saying this to, to indicate it, says John says, by what kind of death he was about to die. So the crowd answers him and said, We heard in the law that the Christ the, is to remain forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Wait, wait a minute. Who is this Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is amongst you. Walk while, while you have the light, so that darkness does not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. But while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may be sons of the light. And these things Jesus spoke as he went away, and he hid himself from them. 
But though he had performed so many signs before them, John says, yet they were not believing. You'd think a voice from heaven crackling, I have glorified thee and I will glorify you again would do it. But when God does big miracles like that, does that make people believe? God raises someone from the dead. Does that make them automatically believe? No, it does make them curious. Some people, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, in fact, I think that that's probably one of the things that distinguish Jesus from all other religions. You know, in all the other religions, we don't have a count of the leader raising people from the dead. And we don't have an account of the leader himself dying and then coming back himself from the dead. This is what, when some of your friends are going to say, why are you into, you know, following Christ versus, like, why, why not follow Buddha or Muhammad or, you know, Harry Krishna or something? I'm like, none of those guys, those guys are still dead. Their bones, people go and, and they travel and they still go to see their bones. They're dead. Christ is risen. Next week, we'll practice. Oh, let's practice for next week. Christ is risen, and you answer, He is risen indeed. That's right. What? Hallelujah. Oh, you're going Pentecostal now. <laughs> Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, guys, for extra credit, let me tell you that these, Jesus, or John tells us that these guys, their heart was hard. With all these signs, they didn't believe. And, and John tells us why. He says it's because it's according to the word of the Lord what Isaiah prophesied. Isaiah prophesied and said, Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah again says that God has blinded their eyes. He hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes. They would not perceive with their heart and they would and, and be converted and God would heal them. So these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. When you see his glory, that's when your eyes get open. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because the of the Pharisees, they would not confess him for fear that they be put out of the synagogue. Now verse 48, I just got three verses left to finish the chapter. I might as well read it to you and end, end here. It says, he who rejects me he says, and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. Jesus said he didn't come to judge. The word he spoke will do the judging. He says, for I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, these things I speak and I speak just as the Father has told me. You know, this is the part I really wanted to drive home, but there's always a distraction when you get to the part that's the, the most important part. You know, and the enemy loves to do that. I just, I guess I've been in the Lord long enough, I go, so someone goes, you must be doing something right. You always get the crazies come out when it's time to really, I'm like, you know, okay. But listen to this as we close with this thought. Jesus said, I know that God's commandment is eternal life. Therefore, these things I speak just as the Father told me. I came to tell you what he commanded. You know, God's command to Jesus was, Son, go give them everlasting life. Right? We, in, we're in John's gospel, but John 3.16, one of the most quoted verses from this gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting. everlasting life. Jesus came to give everlasting life. And this world is perishing. People are like, man, I need that. I'm like, you ain't the only one. We all do. We all, we all need that touch of God's life, that, that, that life he imparts to us, that, that it, it's a life from inside. I mean, it makes us alive spiritually. And we need that life. We're, we're, we're designed for it by God. You are designed to have life everlasting with our Father. 
And yet the one thing that held back those people, I don't know if you noticed verse 42 is kind of being interrupted while I was trying to read it to you. But it's a little quieter now. I'll, I'll review it. Nevertheless, many of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they might be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of who? Of God. You know, sometimes people are so close to coming to believing and then some family member goes, you're not really going to be one of those Jesus freaks, are you? You're not really going to believe in Jesus, the Son of God. If we're looking for approval from men, we're going to miss the mark. And John was willing to say that. He was willing to say, why, the f why would those religious leaders not come forward with their faith? Because they love the approval of men. Not the approval of God. I learned a long time ago, forget the approval of men. It is so fickle. Men will love you one day. They'll praise you. Next minute, I mean, talking about the, like the football player does great play. Everyone's cheering. The whole stadium is on their feet. Next play, fumbles the ball. They hate him. They want to crucify him. I mean, it's not an easy thing to, to please a crowd. And if you love the approval of men and that's what you're after, good luck. Because approval of men is fickle. It goes up and down and up and down. And you don't really, in, in the course of this life, you don't need fickle. You need faithful. You need something that lasts. You need to get the approval of God in heaven that will last for eternity. Because if he approves of you, you're golden. It doesn't matter what else happens. You got his approval. And that's what ultimately will count. And that's why Jesus came. He said, I came to do my father's command. He commanded everlasting life. Go give him everlasting life. And he said, that's what I'm here to do. But he told what he had to do to give us everlasting life. He said, I have to go now and die. And next week, we'll look at his resurrection as we celebrate. Now, Good Friday, some of you might want to go to a Good Friday service. We have different fellowships. We don't, we don't have our own because we don't have a facility, but there are other fellowships in our community. And we don't compete with each other, by the way. We complement one another. We're, we're not in competition. So if you want to go to Good Friday service uh, somewhere else and just hear the message of how you know our Lord was laid to rest, he gave his life that day and was buried. And three days later, we'll come back together next week to celebrate his resurrection. And we'll, and we'll, and we'll rejoice in his resurrection and enjoy that, that comforting news that Christ is risen from the dead. But he says what he's going to do now. He's going to go die. The whole donkey ride was just, just to say, I'm on my way to go what? Die. I'm on my way to die. So I can bring everlasting life. And that's the message of the gospel. Christ did the work. He died for us. And all we have to do is believe. He said, I come as light into this world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If you don't want to be in spiritual darkness, believe in Jesus. He will illuminate your life. He will light your path. He will, I mean, the light will come on when you put your faith in what he did. And then some of those tricky things you thought, well, I didn't understand that at first. That's when you start to really understand scripture. It's when you put your faith in the guy who's the light of the world. That's when you get the understanding. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for the privilege to get to share the gospel out on a beach in Hawaii, even with ones that are troubled. Lord, we pray for the man that was troubled this morning, that you would help him, just as we want you to help us, Lord. We all desire your help, Father, for, for many myriads of things, Lord. Help to our physical bodies where we're weak. Help to broken hearts, Lord, that need mending. Help to any any part of our spirit, Lord, where we feel weak in our faith. Lord, help us strengthen our faith as we prepare for this week to celebrate your resurrection, Jesus. Just help us. Build us up in our faith. I pray for Barnabas and for Herb and those that will pray at the prayer table for anyone in need, Lord, that today your spirit would touch those needs and people would receive the answered prayers that they bring before you. We just thank you that we can be together and bask in your word. Thanks for holding back the rain, Lord. Help us pack it all up before it comes 
In Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.